would cut up the fish and distribute it, encouraging seagulls to cluster around a submarine or a periscope. When training animals to find the enemy proved a dead end, the Royal Navy decided to change tack. Instead of going to the enemy, why not bring the enemy to you? Decoy ships, called Q-ships, were sent to patrol waters where U-boats were known to operate. Usually converted merchant vessels, the Q-ships bristled with hidden weapons and were crewed by Royal Navy sailors. Someone came up with the idea of disguising merchant vessels who would then attract um, the attention of a U-boat. And the U-boat would then come in on the surface to take it out by gunfire, at which point all the heavily disguised guns, which could be disguised as funnels or sheet pens, all sorts of things we used, would fall away. There's the gun. Bang. Despite the ingenious idea, the Q-ships were not very successful. In World War I, for 38 Q-ships lost, they only managed to destroy 19 U-boats. It was obvious that semi-trained animals and decoys were not going to be enough to combat the submarine. Reliable methods of detecting submarines whilst under the water desperately needed to be found. The first generation of effective anti-submarine technology came online during World War I. Sonar. There are two types of sonar, active and passive. Passive sonar, you simply listen. Everything in the sea makes a noise to some degree, and if you've got a sensitive enough receiver, you can hear that noise and deduce the bearing, but not the range of the target. Active is the one that everybody thinks about, the one that makes the ping into the water. You simply transmit this pulse and then listen for the echo, and the echo will give you a range and a bearing of the target. Sonar made the submarine's environment its enemy. Any sounds coming from the sub's engine or crew could now be picked up and the sub's position calculated. Finding the submarine is just the first step. Once located, it must be destroyed. And a technology for doing that was developed by the Royal Navy in 1916. Depth charges are invented during the First World War when the Royal Navy creates a weapon that they will consider a sort of droppable mine that they can sort of roll off of the back end of a ship, typically the size of a barrel, filled with explosives and with a depth gauge on it so you can set at which depth they're going to detonate. Together, sonar and depth charges were the bane of the submarine in World War I and World War II. An accurate depth charge attack would rip open the submarine's hull or do so much damage that it would be forced to the surface and face the guns of a waiting destroyer. To those on the receiving end of a sustained depth charge attack, it was an unforgettable experience. We were down in the southern part of the Philippines, but we sighted a convoy with two destroyers and two merchantmen, and we fired at them. As soon as we hit that first one, while these two destroyers came after us, we were in 130 feet of water, and we were laying on the bottom, and you could hear these screws of the destroyers running over us. And when the depth charge was in the water, you would hear a loud click. And that was the igniter, and as soon as the igniter went off, like, then you heard the boom. And then the boat would rock, and it'd shake you. It's like going over a bump in the road. You'd bounce like. Lights were blown out, cork had come off the bulkheads. I think it was nine or 10 hours, we took a total of 98 depth charges. If he had perspired a lot, it was, it was hot. Of course, I suppose everybody's saying their prayers. <laughs> we finally brought the boat up to periscope depth, and we looked around, and we didn't see anything. So we hightailed it out of there. <laughs> the huge numbers of depth charges required to kill a submarine made them very inefficient. Any miscalculation meant that the charges would detonate in the wrong place, and an enemy sub could survive, slip away, and live to fight another day. An evolution in depth charge technology created a ruthless sub killer. Called Hedgehog, this weapon system was a prickly problem for any submarine that encountered it. The Hedgehog uh, consists of about 30 small bomblets. 
Each bomber, about 30 pounds. 30 pounds against the hull of a submarine is lethal. It will punch a hole. So the aim here is you're, you're replacing one big charge with 30 little ones. During the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II, Hedgehog increased submarine kill rate from 7% to 25%. No submarine has ever been known to survive a direct hit from a Hedgehog attack. From 1943 onwards, the combination of sonar and depth charges smashed the Axis submarine forces. Together with the cracking of the top secret Enigma codes the Germans used to communicate with their subs at sea, the U-boat threat had finally been tamed. But just when submarines looked down and out, a technological landmark turned the tables completely. With the arrival of nuclear power, submarines could stay submerged longer, go faster, and were much harder to detect. Nuclear propulsion for submarines makes it infinitely harder for warships to try and attack them successfully. They're fast, and they are much more difficult to attack. Never again would the partnership of sonar and depth charges play such a major role in combating the menace under the waves. With all the depth charges, all the mines, all the surface ships, all the aircraft in the world don't do you any good if you don't know where the submarine is and all you end up doing is killing a bunch of fish. The solution for those hunting the submarine was simple. Build subs to hunt subs. Turning on their own kind, the next generation of attack submarines would now be built with one brief, to find and destroy other enemy subs. The idea of sub versus sub was developed soon after World War II. We realized that submarines were going to become a much greater threat than they were during World War II. Today, the best anti-submarine weapon we still have in our arsenal is another submarine. Since the Cold War, dedicated hunter-killer subs, called SSNs, have covertly roamed the oceans, sniffing out enemy ballistic missile subs. It's only with the Cold War that submarines have sophisticated enough technology to really become true hunter-killers, allowing them to pursue, track, and, if need be, sink one another. Now, in the 21st century, there is little that can touch the submarine. But the threats to Western democracies are still very real, and they are multiplying fast. What is needed post-Cold War is a class of submarines with the flexibility to handle any mission that is thrown at them. Eavesdropping, rapid insertion, anti-submarine warfare, and land attack. Those subs are the Virginia class. Now you find submarines getting in close, uh, delivering special forces, shadowing and uh, gathering intelligence on surface ships and things like that. And the Virginia are the first submarines to be completely designed post the Cold War. So they reflect this new emphasis. Today's submarines are truly a sum of their parts. Drawn together, the branches on its family tree reflect its unique genesis. Chemical explosives gave birth to torpedoes. Rocket technology spawned ballistic missile submarines. Stealthy nuclear-propelled subs evolved into the world's deadliest weapons platforms, the USS Virginia class. Weaponologically, it's top of the tree. Next